started, so I'll just say a few things. My name is Anja Lundbeck from Local Futures, uh, and um, welcome to all of you. This is a, a very special moment. And uh, welcome to those of you that are also watching us and will be watching the recording afterwards, uh, which we'll be sharing widely, of course. And uh, uh, what we're going to do is that we're going to have with, uh, I won't introduce each one. You'll have to introduce yourselves because otherwise I'm going to take up too much time. Uh, and because uh, <laughs> we are a lot of people here. So we're going to go around quickly with everybody and hear a, li a little bit from everybody, just a couple of minutes about uh, what's going on in their country or, or what they've been doing around World Localization Day, because everybody that are here are global partners in this campaign that we put on World Localization Day and have been hosting their own events in connection with this and, of course, are doing a lot the fabulous work uh, in their home countries or areas in some also internationally uh, around these issues of how we make a better world and uh, a system shift also both in our thinking and in our doing. And uh, after that, uh, hello Gunnar, you made it. Good evening to you in South Korea. Hi. Hello, hello. So after we go around a couple each, each person, we wanted to, in the second sort of part of this, we want to hear from everybody, you know, a go around about how you think we can move forward. There's some wind in somebody's microphone. It would be good to mute. Yeah, it's good. It's quite good if everybody can mute the the microphone if they're not speaking yeah that's much better thank you yeah. and then so we can, uh, we can, we'll, we can say that with. later again can't we you can go around now with yeah. The, yeah yeah okay good uh anyone wants to to start or otherwise i'll just pick at random oh yeah sure <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah. Elsa, thank you. Yeah, off you go. Yeah, okay. And hand, hand over to someone else when you finish, please. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Uh, yes, my name is Elsa Schagen, and I'm from the Tipping Point Foundation in the Netherlands. And a little bit about us. Uh, we believe in the importance of systems uh, change, uh, of different economic models, and we try to support people and projects uh, that work together um, to a transition to a more healthy planet and a more healthy society. Uh, and we do this through organizing events with speakers uh, that trigger new ideas on sustainability, but also on systemic change. Um, and we try to inspire and work with social entrepreneurs and with other types of entrepreneurs uh, that are interested in social change. Uh, and we think it's important that they are part of that process. Um, and yeah, we help with uh, creating new ideas, funding, uh, plus campaigning, uh, and bring um, to life several projects like the Pollinator Project uh, that we do. Um, and yeah, for, for World Localization Day, we organized kind of like a local feast. Uh, and that was next to a food forest. Um, and that was with local entrepreneurs who work on alternatives for the current food system. And we tried to have a, have a dialogue with them about how they see lo localization. And I think that's pretty much it in two minutes, right? I think. I... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And now maybe um, to Guna. Yes. Is my is it my turn? <laughs> yes, please. You... Yeah, I I was a little bit late. 
So just I, I, I'm going to introduce myself and my organization and what I'm, I have done and in two minutes. Yeah. Okay. My name is Gona. I, I'm an economist teaching ecological economics at the university. And I'm also representing a, a, a civic uh, think tank, NPOs, uh, Lab 2050, to address the, the future agenda, uh, not just for the South Korea, but for the Asian uh, countries or around the globe together. And I'm, I have worked with uh, Seoul Metropolitan uh, City Government and so uh, Office of Education, uh, which covers around 500 uh, elementary, middle, and high school. And currently, I'm more uh, interested in changing the, the textbook for the, the school of economy. So circular economy or a local economy, social economy should be the should be the the model for the future generations, replacing the neoclassical and neoliberal or uh, globalized uh, economic theory and economic policies. And for this. Uh, World Localization Day 2021. I organized uh, actually a three, but eventually two uh, events. One is about the GPI, Genuine Progress Index. And thankfully, uh, I invited uh, Helena and Clifford Cup as the keynote speakers, and it was very good. And Many news medias covered the news, covered the event, thankfully. And the second one is I'm working with and I'm helping the younger generations who are very much interested in and concerning the climate crisis uh, for their own uh, survival. So I'm helping younger generations uh, in terms of uh, encouragement or in terms of uh, uh, providing the network like like local futures or Claremont Eco Forums, something like that. So this is the second uh, year I was engaged in World Localization Day or Localization Weeks. So I was very uh, satisfied and I'm looking forward to continue this type of collaboration for a long period with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guna. Can yeah. you hand it over to somebody else? Oh, <laughs> all right. Pick someone. Okay. Uh, I'm, yeah, Salim Dara, please. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me, Salim? Yes, now I'm hearing you. How were mm -hmm. you? Fine, thank you. Thank over you to you, for... Salim. Thank you for giving me, giving me, giving me the, the possibility to, to talk about what I'm doing, what is my organization and uh, my country. My name is Salim Dara. I'm working in agroecology. That's now about 30 years. So I've got experience that can help me show to young people what to do with their life. With a life to take themselves in charge. It means do their own action in agriculture, agriculture and entrepreneurship. So why I am with local features, I can say is much what I think as my vision. We have to promote agroecology. We have to promote agroforestry. And for it, just to have, first of all, 
what we must eat. That's why I say, grow your food and consume your local food. That is the first thing. I'm doing since about 10 or more years. And I met Tamera about four years now. And together we are for defend the sacred. We can defend the sacred because for us life is very important for everybody, for all, for people, for trees, for the soil, so then we can work for Terra Nova. And then I met Elena there, and now we are engaged. Our commitment, I think, is to co-create a new world. And for that one, I think this first year of participating in World Localization Day, it is an opportunity for me to do again what I think. Have my work as part of getting Africa out of poverty, going outside from globalization that take us back and then try to create local economy. That's what I can say. My English not so well, but I try what I think. Thank you. This is Salim from Benin, Dugu. Thank you. Thank you so much. And can you pick someone up? Uh, yes, let's say, uh, who can I pick? Uh, I don't know how to take it to do it. Okay, I'll do it. How about you, Shanks? Jesus Iglesias, Iglesias Schauga. Oh, okay. okay, all right. Jesus. Thank okay. you, Salim. So good thank to you. see you. And thank you for your wonderful photos. Thank you. All right, thank you, Salim. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, Helena. Um, nice to meet you, everybody. This is Jesus Iglesias from Malaga in southern Spain. So I started collaborating with uh, Local Futures about two years ago when I translated the book Local is Our Future into Spanish. Uh, since then, uh, we've been in touch and doing many things. I work at, at a cooperative called the Social Climate. We facilitate social innovation for climate action, uh, mostly on the local level, but also internationally. Uh, we are currently focused on two main projects that are related to localization and to nature-based solutions. These are the Climate Journey, which are walking tours around the city to solve the impacts, causes, and solutions to the climate crisis and inequalities locally. And La Bocana de la Bonillas, which is an eco-neighborhood project, uh, which encompasses a series of local economy social businesses, uh, like a co-working space, an incubator, a uh, food store, a cafeteria, etc., and a community space. And for World Localization Day, we've held three events. Uh, one was a local citizen assembly to discuss what are the priorities for our community and city here in Malaga after the pandemic. Um, also a social forum on sustainable rural development at, the, uh, at a beautiful agroecological farm called uh, the Lemon Ranch. And finally, a climate journey in the uh, harbor and, and river area of the city to focus on uh, how nature-based solutions can foster a local economy in the city. Thank you very much. And over to um, Stella George. Hello, thank you so much. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, yeah, you are, Stella. Yes. Thank yeah. you, thank you so much. I have a bit of an internet connection, so in case you lose me, please let me know. <laughs> So uh, yeah, thank you once again. And thank you, uh, Anya and Helena for doing all this. I think uh, to begin with, um, okay, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Stella and I'm from Development Alternatives India. And by training, uh, I'm an economist, but um, at heart, I mean, it should not be a but. Uh, and uh, at heart, I actually want to bring about a change. And I think uh, this, the name of the session is so beautiful, co-creating a movement for the work for a world we want. Uh, I think uh, there couldn't uh, be a better name. Just quickly about what Development Alternatives does. It's basically a social enterprise and it's dedicated to sustainable development in 
we actually try to bring about research and try to back it up from uh, with the with evidence from ground so we are also a think tank and we're also working on the ground and we try to bring these two things together for a better sustainable future now as far as what we did as part of the world localization day this year we are actually a part of this network called as vikalp sangam and there are multiple organizations part of this as as part of this particular network four organizations came together uh, development alternatives was one of them and along with that we had the national coalition for natural farming we had kalpavrik and we had bhumi college so all of us were actually co-hosting a series of dialogues as part of the world localization day program this year and uh, so i think kankana is here from kalpavrik so, so i think she'll be shedding more light on the first event but a bit about the second uh, the second discussion that was held as part of this series this was actually held on the 15th of june this is basically a a trialogue format as we call it so as part of this format actually a minimum of three voices are brought together and all these three voices bring different perspectives so we had one representative from uh, a professor from an academic institution we had um, a a a think tank a representative from a think tank also looking at financial aspects and uh, we also had one practitioner who was actually the ceo of a particular uh, enterprise now bringing these three voices the discussions we actually had were around uh, basically how to foster and enable an ecosystem that would actually help um, micro and small uh, enterprises to grow now there are a couple of things that they require they need access to finance they need uh, access to markets and they also need to know techniques and have better access to technology so and and in order to enable this there are a lot of factors that are required so so few things that we actually talked about uh, is how the food system in india is and how does whether or not it supports uh, micro entrepreneurship and basically what are the signature issues that are faced by these local farmers and these entrepreneurs and as we try to grow and outscale how do these issues differ then there were a few issues about how um uh, how innovations in financial instruments can actually help these small uh, enterprises to grow and so that uh, because these investments they they take a much longer period for their returns and uh, one very interesting aspect in which uh, something i was personally very interested in was what is actually local what do we understand by it and most importantly where do we draw, draw the boundaries when it comes to consumption and investment so these are a few aspects that we touched upon and uh, i would love to share the entire recording because i think it was a great discussion and all the participant and the speakers conveyed to us that they actually had a great time and uh, yeah that's it and i think it would be best if i now give it to kankana so that it's all connected thank you stella thank you thank you stella i think um so okay uh, my name is kankana and i am also from india and as stella already mentioned i represent uh, kalpavriksh it's an environmental action and research group based in pune in india and right now on this panel i am also a member of uh, vikalp sangam so i think a little bit, uh, i'll just give you a brief about what the kalp sangam is it means alternative confluences in english and uh, this process is a very co creative process which emerged in around 2010 and 12 where um, there were individuals and groups that had come together to share their own experiences of uh, working for many decades on various alternative initiatives and as well as also developing certain models for uh, you know alternative transformations so i think as part of the process we uh, we have been you know uh, in collaboration with local cultures in uh, you know in co hosting the entire event but i would like to speak something about myself where i uh, have been working on initiatives of craft and uh, women's health and nutrition and i've also worked with uh, district local government organization uh, so local government uh, departments where uh i think that is where i understood how uh, certain government in fact all government policies are very centralized and despite having huge amount of funding into uh, projects uh, you know to to help uh, uh, increase the nutrition within women it's still going into vain because it's so centralized that 
the entire idea of local based diet is lost and that is why i think we we have still not been able to see progress in india especially in the region where i have been working for around 2 years now and um, so i think largely in uh, i i i studied my masters in ecology and i think i'm still working in similar fields but also trying to expand it into uh, understanding what alternatives means what transformation within the communities mean and what are the challenges where you know instead of of romanticizing the idea of traditions we also need to understand the inherent uh, you know existing inequalities and um, certain understanding of uh, you know for instance i have worked in uh, in uh, in in a place where i was trying to work with local crafts communities in understanding how transformations have been happening over over decades and intergenerational on various aspects and how how their uh, local economy which was which was part of the value chain has now become you know a global market where people are selling their clothes internationally now so i think uh, that's it about myself thank you and uh, kankana i think one last thing so as part of the series the last uh, the last event that we had was actually uh, titled reclaiming our food systems through sustainable farming practices and this is actually a compilation of uh, interview podcast with individuals who are actually working on localization initiatives across the food system value chain and there's this video that has been that is on the vikalp sangam page and i think in some time i'll just paste the link also but uh, this is this was our third dialogue in the series so yeah and kangan i think you should pick the next person uh, i'll just uh, say that we all the recordings from the webinars from our partners that we hope we'll get all of them we will be sharing them we'll okay, putting sure. it up on yeah. world localization day 2021 <laughs> we haven't quite got there yet <laughs> yeah. please hand over i'm going to go has stefan spoken so hello one moment hello stefan so do you see do you see the presentation yes or Yes. Okay. One second. So, hello. Hello, local, local futures worldwide. My name is Stefan, and I'm from a village near Leipzig in Germany. I'm a medical doctor and one of the founders of our association, Uferleben. Our we are, association. Stefan, uh, is yeah? it on purpose that we are seeing the presentations, presentations of you? We're seeing all the slides. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, our association is based on on four on four foundations: the citizen participation, its nature conversation, its education, and what's the last one? One second. I'm over. I lost it a little. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, and now it's better. Yes. We're seeing all the slides. It doesn't matter, okay. but it doesn't matter. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe it yeah. does. And here are some Please. here are some examples of our work. We started here in, in Germany. Our our first thing is a Naumsi, the nature circus. We have been doing nature and environmental education for children since 2018. And with our Naumsi method children deal intensively with a certain topic we use circles as a translational method to convey educational content in a playful way as a result of an obvious lack of citizen participation and sustainability in our political landscape we advocate more citizen participation in various formats speaking about food sovereignty we've been starting a community garden some years ago in our village and we are now in progress to reviving an old nursery with a holistic concept. This was the place where our local food feast this year take place. It was Leipzig local feast, food feast, the secret garden. We are developing an up-to-date concept with the nursery till March, 2022 with support of one of the oldest German university of organic farming and local actors in sustainable agriculture and food economy. Speaking about biodiversity next to our community garden, we started this year a 10 hectare, 25 acre blooming sponsor area. 
and we stand up for local nature to prevent unnecessary land intensive development projects in our area. Act local, think global. Last year, we, with the support of Surf Rider Australia, Greenpeace Norway, and the Wilderness Society Australia, we wrote an article for the English Resurfing magazine about the successful fight against the plans of the Norwegian oil company Equinor to, extra, to extract oil in the Great Australian Wide. And it was through the intensive exchange with Australia that we finally became aware of local futures, and we would be happy to be part of the movement. In the end, the global crisis needs a global response. Let's connect and work together. And I will hand over, where is it? I've lost here. You lost us. Who's the next one? Shall I? I'm happy Thanks. to go. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks, Stefan. Um, I'm uh, Shankari or Shanks as many people call me. Um, I'm an architect and I'm based in Bristol but was born in Sri Lanka. I've been involved with Local Futures now for about 16 years um, and I wrote my master's thesis around uh, making development sustainable and how it was a paradigm looking at the Sri, Lan Sri Lanka and the UK as a case study. So I've always had a passion about it. Um, in Bristol, um, two weeks ago, we had a talk in Temple Church with um, some speakers who were um, uh, the previous mayor of uh, Bristol, who was an architect, through to bankers who were running the, one of the most ethical banks in the world, Triodos Bank. So it was a really, really interesting talk that we did. I'm also on the board of the RIBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects, with 44,000 members. And I teach at Cardiff University and Bath University. So for, for me and um, what we're doing in Bristol, what's really important to us is regenerative thinking and also the fact that 36% of our global energy goes on the construction industry um, and, and buildings. So we've got a huge amount of work to do as a series of organisations within the built environment field. And then a lot of it also has to happen on the ground. So we really are looking at our food systems, looking at how to reduce the big metal car on the road. 80% of our public spaces are given over to cars. So how are we going to you know, reduce the amount of cars, give that back to the communities for social well-being and the environment? So that's just a little, there's, there's many different spheres. It's about you know having days where there's no sort of um, cars on the road through to changing our food systems. One in five people in Bristol are in the food industry, which is absolutely wonderful. We're really lucky to have the sort of flavors and the, and the wonderful local food that's coming into the city, but we need to make it work more efficiently. And that might be about, you know, having hubs at the edges of the city with electric cars for delivery and electric bicycles for delivery to come into the city with less cars coming in as well, because we're also one of the highest polluted and um, the most traffic of any city in um, the UK. Thank you. Thank you. You picked oh. someone else. Yeah. Can I hand over to Imelda? Hi, hi everyone. Um, good to be here. My name's Imelda Havers and I'm here from York, UK. Uh, the other end from Shanks of, of, of uh, England. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm with an organisation called Yoko, which is short for York Central Co-Owned. And what we're trying to do is quite ambitious, really. We're trying to, uh, we're taking, looking at an area which is currently half developed and half brownfield site on the edge of the city of York, which is in the northern part of England, um, and looking at how we can co-create a community owned mixed use neighborhood um, on, on the site. It's a big area. And at the moment, the local authority and the la la landowners, which are government agencies, are looking to develop something which is fairly standard, developer led, um, lots and lots of apartments and offices uh, with a tokenistic bit of green space in, in the area. We're pushing back. We've actually set up an organization. Um, it's a company limited by guarantee involving a whole raft of local people to say, actually, we can improve on this. How can we get hold of some of this space ourselves and create a sense of community there 
um, that also tackles climate change um, through low or zero carbon development that's well connected uh, for pedestrians and cyclists and public transport, not for the motor car. Um, so it's low carbon, it's community and crucially affordable in the long term, because York, like many other cities across the globe, um, has a real problem with afford affordable housing uh, for local people. So what we're trying to do is create um, homes that work for local people and can be afforded by them in the long term. So that's what Yoko is about. We had an event as part of the World Localization Week uh, last Monday, the 14th, which we're delighted to say it was an online event. It was attended by over 60 people from right across the globe. So we had nearly every continent uh, represented there, which is amazing. Talking about just this, how can we create a co-own neighborhood? And we, were, we had a great discussion because what became apparent was that although lots of different people chipped in with uh, their different ideas from across the world. We also found that we shared aspirations and we shared frustrations, I suppose. Uh, so, you know, looking at things like how can we get affordable housing in? How can we rewild certain areas? How can we create local food? How can we shorten distribution chains? So there was a huge, really, really good discussion as part of that, which is uh, on our website, we've, uh, we've we, we started it with a short video about what we're doing at Yoko. So um, I'll post in the chat box the, um, our website address and you can actually get a copy of the recording of the discussion. But as, as Anya said, it'll probably be distributed anyway through Local Futures. So in a nutshell, that's what we do. And, um, you know, delighted to be here and take any questions. Um, and I am going to... I'm just going to uh, say, Melda, your the videos were shared in today's program. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, but of course, we'll they'll continue to be shared, but Great. as will other okay. people's videos. No. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I will hand over to Nelson. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm still wondering whether my video is going to be very clear. Uh, today is very. Um, I think it might be better without your video, Nelson, because you are breaking up. And it's windy. I'm speaking from outside. And I'm, I'm a farmer. I'm in fact one of the target groups. Many organizations would love to work with. Yeah? I have that passion on uh, endogenous thinking and endogenous kind of working where we have to think from local actions and connect ourselves to our spiritual well beings and then begin a journey on life and sustainability, where we believe we have to work closely with nature we have to nurture what is far more important than this value onto other well-beings we are not very superior in the ecosystem so my work i am the national coordinator for the zimbabwe smallholder organic farmers forum which is primarily an organization a movement that is just growing of smallholder farmers who have thought a journey that they have to move along the path of sustainability in, with a major focus on uh, agroecology, which has become one of the buzzwords many of those organizations are talking about. But to us, it's not about the word itself, but it is all about our actions with nature and our actions with our seeds, our actions with the waters of the earth and our actions with the soils and our actions that is primarily focused on what we do at local level. And we are so much connected uh, to the global level. Just by end of this month, we are rounding off our hosting of the International Office of La Via Campesina that is shifting now to Europe. But it has been in Africa for the past eight years under the custodianship of uh, Zimsov. And it has been a very important experience that we have got to connect to many farmers across the globe. We have that pension on trying to talk about the farmers' rights and trying to build what is local. Uh, 
in our work we emphasize a lot on uh, our local food systems yeah and within our regions where we want to promote what we can grow from our own local seeds and what we can what we know and we in as much as the nutrition content of the food that we 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 eat and that spreads through we organize uh, fairs we organize and or through consumer awareness and also linking ourselves to institutions of higher learning the universities and at the same time uh, research and development organizations that if that feeling to support farmers there is this feeling that farmers don't know but i wonder if you would listen to my way of speaking and Farmer, uh, it means it means some steps of recognition and consideration, even at post level, when you talk about the farmers' rights and making sure that at least all the farmers are actually taken on board whenever any decision uh, is concerned with that matters. The farmers is concerned, and one of those issues is how to grow our own food from our own seeds. What is the policy saying in as far as promotion of local seed seed, seed, seed system is concerned, and what is the policy saying? in as far as local food production is concerned and in as far as these food miles you know where uh, a chicken can be raised in in africa and then later consumed in europe you know that much distance of just flying a bed is what we want to avoid and try to build local economies based on what we know and what we understand <clears throat> in brief that's our work with zimso we are very free to be connected to any organizations that might be interested to support the farmers in Zimbabwe. Thank you. I Thank think, you. Yeah. I think, Jay, you, you're the last one, I have, yeah. according to my list. Last but not least. Okay. Thank you for saying that. And um, thank you for the invitation to be here. It's really a great honor to be uh, here with all of you. And it also feels really nice that we're all connected through Local Futures. So thank you very much, Helena and Anya, for all of your work to, to make all of this happen and to connect us in this way. Um, I'm calling in from Totnes in Devon in the southwest of the UK. And it's a place that is the home of Schumacher College and uh, the transition towns movement and, and so many other things. Um, I've been here for about 10 years and I've been involved in a lot of things. And over these last 10 years, we've seen a real blossoming of, of uh, economic relocalization and um, uh, regenerative initiatives of all kinds that we would probably all embrace wherever we are. So we're very lucky we're in a place where there's so much happening um, I helped to start up the Reconomy Project 10 years ago as part of Transition Town Totnes, and we've been focused on trying to work in a systems way to support economic relocalization. And we do a lot of fun things, something called the Local Entrepreneur Forum that helps to get the community involved in the entrepreneurial process. Also, uh, we have a co-working space called the Reconomy Center. We've been trying to work through networks too and develop networks across our region to spread the innovations that we're working on to learn from others. And through that work, um, a, a local cooperative bank is, is starting up. We're not taking credit for it, but, but creating, holding the spaces and, and convening um, those kinds of network events, I think really has been powerful. Another project that started up from that is Local Spark in Torbay. This is a, a city next door to us that has loads of deprivation and problems and we're bringing this kind of approach there and it's been really um, successful so far in a, in a couple of years and we're working very closely with the council on their community wealth building program and also working with people who were kind of at that very base level working in this sort of infertile social soil so to speak um, where where the first step really is just getting people to feel some trust and some confidence and connected with one another I also uh, teach uh, this sort of economics at Plymouth University, and I'm, I'm very happy to say also at Schumacher College on the Regenerative Economics Program. And we've been very lucky to have uh, Helena as a guest into that program over the years. Also, Ashish, uh, Ashish Katari, who's 
somebody that probably many of you know. And um, uh, Schumacher has also just started up a new bachelor's program, uh, Regenerative Food and Farming. So Schumacher has been part of this story as well. And so um, Reconomy, Schumacher, and Local Spark, we threw a big dinner party last Tuesday. It was online. And the idea was to really celebrate all of the initiatives happening in this area and to help people get connected with one another in a fun convivial sort of way. And, and it was fun. And I was a little bit hung over the next day, <laughs> but it was a great dinner party and it really helped to celebrate um, local culture, local uh, food uh, and farmers and all of the other projects that are, that are helping to create local livelihoods. So that's me. So I'll hand it back over to you, Anya or Helen. Helena? Well, we haven't yes. decided yeah. which one of us was hosting, but we're sort of co-hosting in a way. And we really now want to have a, a discussion about how, what your thoughts are about how to move this whole effort forward. How can we strengthen and grow the localization movement in ways that would help you where you are and in, and have any of you got ideas on how to strengthen and grow the movement? Yeah, so we'd like those of you that want to share if you, you have any thoughts on this. Uh, and also in particular, I think how we perhaps can continue you know, to collaborate also on an international level to move this forward so that we have a stronger voice and we can get out there with also um, a stronger message to people about how we can, you know, co-create the world we want. And um, so we hope that uh, all of you will chip in with some ideas here. Anyone wants to start? And don't, yeah, I mean, you don't have to feel obliged to do it, but you know, uh, Melda? Hi. Um, yeah, I think at the heart of a lot of this is, is kind of structural support, um, technical support in a sense from government, um, because we're pushing against a sort of um, the neoliberal orthodoxy, at which basically um, assumes that we have an extractive wealth creation system. So for instance, you own land and that land gives you value that you can then build on to own more land. What that does is it takes land and assets away from people who want to do things differently. So I think in order to counter that, what's really helpful potentially is for governments to help rejig the playing field or re-level the playing field. So for instance, um, two very brief examples in Scotland, uh, in 2015, they introduced the Community Empowerment Act, which empowers communities to get hold of land and assets that become available. So there's quite a few examples in Scotland of communities buying uh, the old Scottish estates and then rewilding them, redeveloping them, rebuilding them for local communities. That's one thing. And the other example is um, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, also of 2015 that the Welsh government um, put into practice uh, in 2015. And what that does is it actually requires any public bodies who make plans or strategies in, for the future that they have factored in um, the impact that it will have on future generations. So I think there's very tangible ways that we can maybe put pressure on governments to say, we need some help here because otherwise we're pushing against the tide. Well, we would certainly agree with that. And we, we also see around the world that the pressure from below is affecting smaller governments and you know, especially local councils and some mayors. So we can see there's a bit of a shift there, but there's, there's so much work to be done in that regard. And, and of course, we are also trying to raise awareness about how from the top, at the level of trade negotiations and global treaties, governments are doing the opposite, handing over more power to global corporations. And that's of course a very sensitive and difficult issue to talk about. 
but we believe that, you know, if we could make some changes at that level, we would see major changes at the local level. But does anyone else have any comments on that, on the issue of trying to influence government policy? I think um, institutions are, are quite a good shout for to, to work towards that. So I think as an example, I guess the um, the RIBA is still such uh, sort of it, it feels a bit like a public sector body. So, you know, with 44,000 people and it having to um, speak to as many voices, you know, just pushing our way through and making suggestions such as them moving their banking are sort of small steps that they can take. But it has to but they can start to influence or try to push to influence policy or change policy in the UK with the, with architecture and and using more sort of passive house techniques and regenerative thinking. And again, I think similarly, you know, you have to take that bottom up approach. So all the kind of marches and stuff that young people in their twenties have been doing, they um, are making small differences as well, and they need to can continue. You know, you, we need both approaches, don't we, to really make a difference, um, both policy at the top and um, grassroots level changes as well. Absolutely. Yeah, just to yeah, plus yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'll go. Oh, sorry. That, yeah. Was that Stella? Yeah. yeah. I'll just take 15 seconds just to add to the conversation. Something that actually came up during our uh, dialogue also was actually the importance of strengthening local institutions in this entire process and the role they play. For example, um, Orissa is one of the states in India, and actually the the local um, the public distribution system over there they actually procured millets from the local farmers, and they actually uh, even sold it at lower prices to the communities around. So this is actually very rare, but this is happening, and the and this was recognized, and the fact uh, and there is hope that you know similar stories will be more in other parts of the country and outside. So I yeah, just to, just want to share that. Thank you. Yeah, the yes, thing that I, I... Go ahead. I agree very much with the whole idea of uh, maybe starting from the local level to strengthen the uh, local institutions. In particular, we here we are emphasizing uh, strengthening uh, the farmers' organizations uh, because the farmers' organizations they command the majority. And uh, when we are talking about strengthening, we are now talking about creating action that is to be seen. Because if, when you want to advocate for policy changes, here yeah, we believe from Southern Africa that we need to have some key examples which have to be our evidence that we need to use as um, key milestones or tools to lobby for change and these have to be seen at the farmers level and this have to be understood and documented you know at farmer level and there's a lot of work that has to be put into place in terms of trying to educate the farmers to be able to have that willing to document whatever they are doing and at the same time to be able to to speak about their uh, existing practices, you know, and when we talk about the issue of, uh, for example, the issue of climate change, what exactly are the practices that the farmers are doing? How are they building their own resilience at local level? And how are they feeding their own communities? Like, for example, the issue of this COVID, how are they able to manage it within the local context? And who is there? Who has that passion and willingness to support their work? I think that that is the first step that we need to uh, to, to to look at and at the same time we, we then need to to connect ourselves to um, many organizations it could be from the civil society organizations it could be from research and development it could be from institution of higher learning that they need to join up hands with with uh, the farmers and they have that uh, uh, willingness as well to support what the farmers are doing and then try to flag out the issues the farmers are doing because they occupy much space all over the world you find the majority are the small world of farmers Hello. Yeah, the thing that I wanted to say is, um, uh, yeah, like, of course, ev every country is different. 
and every place is different. But if I'm looking at in the Netherlands, the thing that I'm seeing is that there are a lot of local initiatives that are blossoming and that are thriving and that are creating more community. But at the same time, I also see that a deeper reverb reflection uh, remains important. Uh, also, when I'm looking at like uh, community uh, strengthening, but also cohesion, as in when you have a great project, like a great local project, uh, like a food forest, then I think it's also important that it doesn't stay within a privileged uh, group that uh, but that it expands to a more inclusive level where also the community that lives around it um, is able to build, is able to benefit. And I think that requires uh, a deeper look at, at what it is truly uh, to connect and also to connect when there is diversity um, and that um, together you hold space for meeting each other in shared needs. Um, so that um, the enthusiasm of a small few is able to transcend beyond the little islands. And I think that's the case for in the Netherlands. I think that's very important, but I think it's different everywhere. Well, I think it's quite a, a common situation that many of these initiatives are started often by relatively privileged people, often sort of middle class. But what's also wonderful is that there are so many examples where they recognize that and where people who are better off, for instance, will pay extra to the farmer so that other yeah. people who can't afford it. This. And that's again, this picture we can see across the world, various forms of local people subsidizing the right direction, the shift. And they need yeah. to do that because our governments are subsidizing the opposite direction, <laughs> you know, subsidizing the corporation. Mm. Yeah, so, like I totally agree. And I just think, or at least here, I think we should f focus more on it. As in, in my country, I think more attention is needed for that inclusiveness and that space holding. But yeah, I totally agree that it's yeah. growing. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to hand over the word to Kankana, who's got her hands up, and then Stefan, you, you're next. Thank you. I think I, in general, agree to whatever everyone has said, and there is a need to bring in structural changes within um, institutions and even within communities to envision the kind of future that we um, are looking forward to. But I think at the core of it, what I have learned from my experiences of interacting with people of my age, or, or even interacting with people in the community is about the value system as to what kind of traditional understandings and values that we actually uphold in order to envision something like this. I mean, debunking the whole idea that localization would cut you off from rest of the universe. Would that actually mean that you cannot travel? Would that actually mean that you have to restrain yourself from trying to, you know, get into an occupation which your let's say which is not a traditional occupation so i think that's something that whenever we are questioning in the communities who are actually the main uh, uh, the, the foundational not i mean back say communities it could be whether it's urban or rural i think all of us in in the whole system would mean how do we consider our values to be part of uh, the whole the narrative which we are trying to build and we are trying to mobilize people with. I mean, a farmer who, for instance, in India with extremely deplorable a deplorable condition right now after Corona, there are there are uh, several stories of hope and resilience which are which are going on right now. And there are I think we have also invited a few people on on board for uh, the discussions. But I think uh, there is a larger chunk of population which is still suffering a lot because of the corona crisis. And I don't think they would want to have a future which is, you know, explaining them certain ideas of justice, of, of gender equality is very much difficult than actually having 
an example and showcasing the example that these things are very beneficial. So I think uh, the foundation to any of the socio-political or, or even cultural changes or ecological changes would mean that there has to be a movement of, of you know, movement where which talks about uh, values, which talks about uh, integrity, which talks about dignified livelihoods. And especially, I think, especially with, uh, I think, what Chankari had just mentioned about, you know, there are there are several uh, youth organizations and movements which are running, and they are actually help, they are actually pressurizing the, you know, the the local administrative powers here. And we have in India, we have Extension Rebellion, and uh, you know, there is Let India Breathe, which is doing an amazing work, and you know, uh, you know, actually facilitating these uh, processes. Stefan, over to you. And we'll get a chance to comment afterwards on what yeah. everybody has said. Okay, what I see from from Germany is a is a is a huge lack of uh, transfer of scientific knowledge. If you look re re regarding to climate change, biodiversity loss, and all this, we we got our local politics got so many so much power to decide things they do in our region, in our area, in our federal states. And they are doing the same politics since 20 years ago. There is much evidence, but there is a, a, a huge lack of transfer, I think, into society and into local politics. And I think this is a, a huge problem. We have to we have to share. And and on the other hand, I think uh, organizations like Local Future would help in this area very much if we connect and learn from each other. And I, I will hope that this conversation will take on in the next time. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I have to say very much our attention, intention. And I also want to say before uh, we move on to somebody else that, uh, you know, we felt so encouraged as, a, as an organization by the participation of all of you and more that could make it here. And there's some coming on, uh, of course, at our next call. Uh, you know, we sort of feel uh, really inspired by the fact that just look at the mix we are here today, you know, a global to local shift and a systemic change requires everybody, no, not sort of silo thinking. And here, I mean, just the representation here today of all of you from all over the world working in different areas, we all realize we have to change direction. And so uh, I, I think that is a fertile ground. For, for doing a lot more collaboration and having more talks like these uh, and more time. No, that's certainly our intention. Um, anyone else? What can we do to co-create a, a movement? And Jesus, you were saying you had something you wanted to share from Malaga. Thank you, very briefly. Um, I wanted to discuss a little bit what's the situation in Spain, which I think is kind of very uh, interesting in the sense that we are about to receive uh, 140 billion euros from the European Union uh, in terms of recovery funds. And how this money is spent um, is going to define the economic model for the next 10, 20 years. Um, at the moment, there are very opposing forces. Uh, one of them is, of course, the status quo, the uh, big industry lobbies, etc., that want to keep the situation as it is in the sense that I'm going to channel most of the money into you know, large corporations and, and so on and just make technological changes uh, for the, uh, you know, the low carbon economy. But there's another uh, force, which is the um, local economy uh, systems in terms of small businesses uh, coming together with uh, civil society organizations on the local level and really proposing a more localized, more diversified economy. And for instance, here in Malaga, uh, we depend a lot on tourism. It's a very monoculture, globalized sector, as you know. And uh, there is the, uh, the, the industry itself, together with the formal institutions. They want to push back into the old model and build a huge skyscraper hotel, uh, massive infrastructure projects, just painted in green, a, little, a lot of greenwashing going on uh, with these EU funds. Uh, but then at the same time, uh, civil society organizations, we are coming together, both uh, environmental and social groups, and we want to, um, you know, form sort of a citizen assembly to define uh, what are the priorities uh, 
that should be put on the table to actually um, sort of design a new economic model for the city that is more inclusive and more equitative, et cetera. Uh, so we are about to start this citizen assembly. We actually organized uh, the first event uh, within local, uh, World Localization Month. And the second one will take place next week. So we are mobilizing civil society to actually say, hey, we need to have a voice in this economic recovery, please. And then on the other side, at the neighborhood level, there's also interesting things happening. Um, the local food systems are really um, thriving at the moment in, in Malaga as a response to the, uh, to the um, high levels of unemployment and, and really uh, a lot of people falling into extreme poverty in Spain as a result of the pandemic crisis. So there's a lot of social support and mutual care networks around food and around housing because we have a big housing problem here in Spain because of tourism, because of gentrification, et cetera. So um, also what's happening is the local uh, entrepreneurship community, the local small business community is coming together for the first time with civil society and saying, hey, we want to uh, demand, uh, advocate for, for change on the local, to the local administration. And at the same time, we want to create local economic networks that are self-reliant a little bit. Uh, you know, we don't want to depend on tourism anymore. So we want to develop our own self-reliant economies. So there's a lot of interesting things happening and we are at the crossroads here in Spain and I think it's pretty much the same everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Well, someone else. I've, I, I have had the chance to be part of a citizen assembly and also think it's a really, really good way uh, to move forward with, with uh, action and get getting above all people that think very differently from all political uh, across the spectrum together to come uh, up with uh, pretty good policy recommendations. And that was at least my experience in Denmark where I was sitting with people from the left to the right and, and uh, uh, of all ages and we actually came up with some really good policy recommendations that would have been, you know, you would have expected to be on sort of a Green Party's list uh, of recommendations. So who else has a hand up here? I thought I saw a hand. Oh, Jay, I don't know why I can't see it. Uh, hi, thanks. Well, I, um, I appreciate and agree with uh, pretty much everything that's been said so far, but. Um, I guess what I wanted to, to add at this point is, um, I guess, uh, some, some learning about methodology and about how uh, we can make change. Um, and I think, um, you know, we probably all agree about, about many of the things that need to happen in terms of economic relocalization starting up more co-ops, uh, working in networks uh, and all this sort of thing. So how? Not a lot of people know how to do it. There aren't that many people who know how to, how to um, practice the new skills of the new economy or the new politics. And so I think this is a really important thing to focus on. So what I'm talking about are, are sort of participatory methods. So creating ways and spaces for people to participate in new ways, because generally people participate as consumers in their lives, whether they're consuming the politics or you know, corporate products and services or whatever. So creating those spaces and opportunities, citizens assemblies are great. How many people know how to actually uh, organize one? Not enough. So, so this I think is really important that the, the practice of the new politics is kind of like facilitation and, and having a full toolbox of these participatory methods. And then this implies that another thing, which is the know-how. So not only the know-how of how to do these things, but the know-how of how to start up a cooperative, the know-how of how to create opportunities for the community to invest in the kinds of projects or to, to speak with a unified and more powerful voice. So that kind of know-how needs to spread and you can't spread it on the internet because if you could, job done, it would, we'd already be there. So it takes people talking to the people next door to them. So if you're in a town, spread the work that you're doing into the next town or the next region or the next county or the next country. And I think then this um, leads me anyway to appreciate the importance of networks. So the global networks like, like of the kind that we're part of right now is super important, 
but also weaving and building diverse networks on the ground wherever we are. Um, so important. This is how information and knowledge spreads. This is how we become acquainted with one another and create the conditions for more ambitious kinds of collaborations. And if we're, you know, if, if we do these things, I think it gives us a better chance to, to relocalize the, the economics and to have the kinds of conversations that we need to be having now with people who are very different from us. Politics in many of our countries, I would suppose, are very polarized. So there are people who just don't want to, they don't want to listen to what you have to say. And how you, I think how you combat that is you listen to them and find the common ground and the kinds of conversations that can lead us together to, to different spaces. So that's something. <laughs> Very helpful, Jay. I think it also, for me, points to the need for a type of education, but outside of the dominant structures. So we should be thinking more creatively about how we can do trainings and you know, to make available online how you can start to set up some of these things like people's assemblies and other aspects of the whole process. Um, and so I think generally that side of things is underfunded and there isn't enough effort put into that. Because part of the education is also highlighting and learning from initiatives that have succeeded elsewhere. And so often people are very keen on actually starting the initiative but as a model, but then there isn't enough effort put into how do you get that model out so more people learn about it. Yeah, Anya, you want to- I, Yeah, I, I'm dying to say something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that is that I think we have a perfect opportunity here, just, just taking all of us here and what you represent as a pool of knowledge and experience. I mean, there's enough here to that we could like in further collaboration, be providing some of that, um, uh, well, teaching and sharing about how you tackle different problems, like uh, how, how do you move on with a GPI, how do you do a citizen assembly, you know, uh, and so much more. Uh, so, I mean, we should really consider that. And I also want to mention that Local Futures will, you know, we've had a team of people working for months on something, uh, a localization action guide and it will be shared online, but it is uh, based on a lot of experience from around the world and will have kind of toolkits that other people, a lot of people have developed in different areas. Uh, and that the idea is of course that people apply that in their own communities. And we hope that will be go some way to help people kickstart a global to local shift uh, where they are. Uh, and uh, so we'll be sharing that with all of you uh, as soon as we've got it up, which will be like in a month's time, we think. Yeah, and I, um, yeah, I, I'm thinking we should probably think of drawing to a close fairly soon, unless there are other comments or suggestions. But I think we should also plan to have uh, conversations again relatively soon. We, to look at how local. We still have 20 minutes, Helena. Well, we have 20 minutes oh. left. All right, if there's, if there's um, conversation to be had. Gunnar. Yeah, uh, as an economist, I feel, uh, many times I feel frustrated and disappointed that at school, especially for elementary, middle, and high school, the textbook of economy, economics is very, very disappointing. And I think we need an alternative uh, textbook. So the Shumar College or the Totnes, the transition uh, town, or yeah, many other grassroots uh, uh, experiments or cases around the globe is a great example of the future textbook, but we need to organize and rearrange and then make it a more uh, louder uh, kind of voices or written documents. So I love the World Localization Day, but this type of, yeah, yeah we need to go 
more or go beyond. So one time or two times meetings or networking is good, but I'm eager to make it more concrete, more, uh, more regular and more resources for, for all of us to get connected and get help, help from it. So in my case, I'd like to uh, design a new inter, in, integrative uh, kinds of uh, coursework or degree programs with the Claremont uh, colleges based on white ideas and ecological economics. So why not uh, think about and discuss uh, based on the local futures, this type of networks to make it more, more diverse, more, uh, more sustainable or more, more resilient type of uh, programs, educational or research or this type of webinars. So that's, uh, I'm hoping to, to, to be part of uh, our jobs. Certainly, definitely what we're looking forward to is more collaboration along those lines. And I want to remind everyone that we are essentially being pressured by the same centralized economic system. Literally the same corporations and banks are pushing every country to move in the same direction. So there's mass urbanization, more specialization, mega technologies, moving us into AI dominated cities. So um, again, this shift towards localizing is the shift towards respecting diversity. But since we're all confronting the same basic problem, there are so many strategies and so much of the thinking is universally relevant. Uh, of course, the universality of Gaia's infinite complexity and diversity is there are certain basic principles there too but it's particularly in this man-made monocultural top-down, very destructive economic system that we are all facing the, the impact of the same monoculture. So that's, yeah, we try to, to provide um, that bigger picture. And I think, yeah, we have to figure out, you know, whether we should be having, um, yeah, some kind of online, perhaps online university style program and where many of you could contribute. Uh, there's, there's a lot of scope, I think, for, for a, a type of collaboration which would hopefully be relevant yeah. across the globe. So I just wanted to say, Gunnar, when you were talking now, so I think we also, we, I mean, very, I mean, it's obviously key that we need to change the textbooks. I'm so glad you're on this job. Uh, you know, the thought of having a different kind of economist uh, is, you know, really um, hopeful. But we, I think we also need, uh, and that could, I think you could also be very, very helpful here, is that we also need, uh, well, tying with maybe the global university or whatever we call it, but uh, programs and, and tools that help us uh, kind of educate ourselves about the economy. I mean, we don't need economists, just economists leading people that don't know anything about the economy because that has been our problem. You know, we wouldn't be in this mess if we had be, been economic literate, no? And, and that goes for politicians as well who have no clue about, you know, who make the money and, and so forth, no? A lot of them. So, uh, uh, so I think that's also something that we really, really need. Uh, uh, simple ways of explaining so that all of us can get become a bit more savvy and therefore can become a bit more effective in how where we direct our attention you know as activists you know if we don't understand the system we we can't really change it no we can't push for the right changes yes because what often happens is that because of ignorance about the dominant global economic system people end up chasing dreams and, and actions and goals, which are actually just not going to deal with the basic problem. And this engine of destructive change continues. 
where local is so important is that we're starting to create by shortening the distances between production and consumption, we're beginning to create genuinely alternative systems. But of course, those are very small. And then when you want to move it up to how can those systems support each other or even to some extent scale up, um, that's where there's a, lot, there's a lot of discussion to be had exactly how to do that. Um, Gunnar, did you want to say something? Oh, okay. Anybody else? Imelda. Hi, yeah, I think it's, um, there seems to be, we seem to be in a moment at the moment, right now of really being able to raise our game to the next level because there's a lot of conversations going on obviously all the brilliant work that Local Futures is doing, but also there's some really good thinkers out there like Kate Rayworth and Donut Economics, um, Mariana Mazzucato and Moonshot Economics, um, the CLES in the UK, which is doing some really good systemic work on creating local wealth um, through, you know, local and central government. So there's some really good thinking going on out there. And I think if we can all somehow plug into what's there, I don't know how local future, I'm sure you're doing that, but I think it's, there is just so much interesting stuff going on at the moment. And there's a really gathering momentum of progressive thinking mm. about genuinely, how can we make those changes? And I, and I think we need to somehow pull that together more tightly. Uh, I'm not too sure what the answer is, but I thought I'd throw it in. Well, I think, well, it's, the, the answer is it does require a lot of a lot of effort and I mean and this is also the tricky thing we're sort of bridging the gap between being a type of think tank and but we're only interested in ideas for action we're not interested in chattering away because we feel there's such an urgent need for action but at the same time we really do believe as Anya was saying that without the economic literacy we are we are much weaker and are unlikely to succeed. For us, the beauty of the economic literacy is recognizing that virtually all the crises we face are connected. And that should be a very empowering idea for people. It's still rather difficult to get them interested in thinking about that, uh, unfortunately, uh, because as long as we keep climate separate from poverty and the loss of democracy is separate from the loss of identity, I think we're, we're doomed. I, and I do see a very clear trend, not only towards a new economy movement, which is already a huge step in the right direction, that people who came from social concerns or environmental concerns are coming together to say, oh, we must focus on an economic shift. But more importantly, beyond that is the recognition of the importance of decentralization or localization. And I don't think, you know, Kate, I've had conversations with Kate about this, Kate Rayworth, and she's not quite there yet. And, but I'm very heartened that people like Naomi Klein, um, who also was actually quite critical of and skeptical about localization, has now come around. So there's been a huge shift uh, in the last few years, and particularly in COVID and after COVID. You know, just that fact that we can't even have, make our own bloody masks, you know, never mind about growing our food, which is of course of so much more importance. Yeah. Any, any other yeah. comments? We do have a few more minutes. Was actually uh, one, one I, I'm someone yeah. had their the hand up, but I can't see who it is. So oh, you're just going to have to grab the mic. Should I just jump in? Yes, yeah, please. please sir. Did you have your hand up? I, yeah, I had it oh, up. Yeah. But that's okay. Did you have it up? It's like hard to that, see. I, or was it? Was it? Is it? I had my. Screen? I had the yellow hand. I clicked the hand button. Oh yeah. Oh, see, and I, then I was jumping up and down. I was yeah, jumping up right. and down for like oh, forty-five okay. minutes before yeah. you. Yeah. Yay, you're suffering. Poor, I think, sorry, I no. think I think humor 
humor is an important part of our work and I, I try <laughs> to introduce that as much as I can. Okay. And it doesn't always work. No. Um, well, what I would like to say is what I think that we can do together in a way that's kind of light touch and doesn't require a lot of um, monetary investment, but it may be an investment of time is to think about how we can build political power on the ground wherever we are. Um, you know, we can, no disrespect intended, but there's plenty of good thinking out there. We're not, we're not lacking the good thinking. We're not lacking the ideas. What we're lacking is in the political power to make shifts. And I think um, working at the base level, we, I think we have to play the long game a little bit. Campaigning, you know, takes a lot of effort and doesn't always get us very far. I'm not a political expert, but I, I do see here in our own place in the UK that we can make a lot of difference by working with local politicians to educate them, bring them along. Every politician wants to be in front of a parade. So when you succeed, you make it easier for politicians to, to, be, uh, to be ready to embrace the, the ideas that you're representing or the projects that you're representing. So I think um, by getting together in ways in, you know, like we are now, we have an opportunity to learn from ourselves, from each other, a little bit about how we can do that, the tactics that can work and, and, um, and that sort of thing. So that's, you know, to me, without the political power, then none of this matters. You know, you know none, of the, none of the talking matters. Um, so it's about doing stuff. Hello, Jay. Yeah. yeah. Can you? Uh, so I think this is uh, very much uh, relevant when you also spoke about interacting with people who are different from us. So I mean, can you say a little bit about how you actually go and talk to public uh, local politicians and what is usually a method? Is there like a, you know, a seminar that you organize or it's just like casual conversation? We try to make it, at least for, for me, I try to first say, okay, what, well, you know what? I'm a human being. This other person's a human being. Hey, can we meet? Can we have a cup of coffee together? Um, can you come to our event? Can you come to our seminar? Um, but just constantly putting the invitation out there and, and just understanding that for the most part, the, 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 um, the people who are, who've got their levers or their hands on the levers of power at the local level, whether they're a bureaucrat or a politician or a local business person or a local representative of big corporate, you know, a lot of them think they're doing the right thing or would like to do the right thing. Sometimes they don't know how, sometimes they just need to be educated a little bit or um, uh, be offered an opportunity to, to have a different perspective. All of us know how to be human beings. So if we rely on that kind of aspect, I think we're, we're able to have a conversation with anyone if, on the other hand, what we're trying to do is to beat somebody over the head with our own ideological agenda, that won't get us very far. I, hey, I'm going to hand over the word to Stefan, who's been having his hand up and is, is now getting lame in his arm, I think. Yeah, in, in advance of the session, we talked about these knowledge hubs or local futures hubs spread it over the world. And I think this would be a, a, good, a good way to spread the message. If, we, if you develop these toolkits to spread this message locally with some local hubs to knowledge transfer in the regions. There's so many people from so many countries, maybe this could be the, the seat in the earth to spread the message. Yes, I think we are very much thinking of doing that. And I think that's an important part of all of this. But there's also it's quite different activities, you know, developing more of the theoretical framework along the lines of what Gunnar was saying. And I, we, we sort of we're trying to work on both on both levels. And in terms of the politics, I guess I'm thinking that wherever possible, talk to, to government. But there's such an important piece of the work, which is to talk policy to the environmental and social movements. And, and that, again, it comes back to understanding economic policy. So we're caught up often in this political theater of left and right, 
which has become almost completely meaningless. And it's very sad that it's still the focus of very heated debate when governments from both left and right have actually been taking us into the arms of a corporate de facto world government. And that really is what's happening. So, so I think the political side is very much about needing to address certain basic economic slash political realities and trying to bring social and environmental activists together. And that of course includes, you know, the social includes the peace activists, the women's rights, indigenous people. It's a, a very broad church. Oh, Stella, you were waiting. Yeah, Sorry. I just, I know a few more minutes. Uh, so basically now uh, we, uh, we actually talked a lot about entrepreneurship. So just taking that forward, knowing that in most of the developing countries, micro and uh, small entrepreneurship actually help in generating a lot of employment. So now we know that all of us need to come together and businesses have their own role to play and definitely at all scales. And now these uh, micro and small enterprises, when they, they are sort of taking the localization movement forward, but as we all know, we don't have time. So it is very important that in all their activities and actions, their impact is measured so that they're inclusive and green in their operations and, you know, at all levels. And of course, there are a lot of roadblocks at, at, at a lot of, at multiple stages, but uh, so actually at um, development alternatives, this is sort of in the innovation stage, but I'm just sharing it. So we're basically trying to develop a metrics to measure, of course, on the uh, economic, social and environmental parameters, but in each of them, looking at the localization component, what in all these three parameters strengthens the localization component and, and we're still working on it. And I think uh, it will be great if it could be a collaborative process. And I think uh, we, if we share it across with all the members over here, I, I think there'll be a lot to, there'll be a lot of value addition to that. So, yeah especially when the financiers also, I mean, there is a lot of uh, influence, civil society is trying to influence the financiers to actually green the banking system. And once that slowly moves ahead, I think uh, measuring the impact of the local enterprises will also help. So basically bridging the gap from both sides. I think that, yeah. Thank you. And I thank you all so much. Yes, Anya. Yeah, I just raised my hand. Uh, yeah. Yes, I think one thing there's so we hear here local hubs, tools that we can do together, the kind of global platform. I, I kind of don't like the word university because it implies something other than I think that what we need, uh, uh, but definitely something where we can all come together and pool the knowledge and the skills that we have so we can get this out more rapidly. And but I also think there's a really great need in terms of sharing. Um, successful like progressive policies that are happening you know all over the world you know because we do need policy change uh we can't just rely on grassroots even though we we, we can do a lot to influence local politicians so as we've just heard and nelson you haven't spoken but you've done you do a lot of that work with influencing your politicians simsoft bring in people uh, 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 or invite politicians and uh and uh, local government employees in all the things that they do, which helps shift their thinking, you know, and opening their minds uh, to other other ways of thinking. So, so pooling progressive policies, and then I think also, you know, uh, the elephant in the room is that I think we need to do something, you know, even if we work on local levels all the way around, we need to get together and join our voice in making demands or and proposals for the re-regulation of, of global finance, you know, the issue of the so-called free trade treaties that we know are shaping, you know, all our economies and our lives and food production and so forth in the wrong direction. So that's also something we have to tackle if we, you know, want flourishing local economies and communities and if we want democracy. I imagine that is quite a big ask of everyone <laughs> and and people, you know, do tend to shy away from talking about those treaties at the global level. I think, I think we are, however, as I said earlier, with Naomi Klein and Russell Brand and, and you know, people like Gabor Mate and so on, with their help, 
I think we may be beginning to have a bit of a breakthrough uh, where, where we'll start addressing this in a structural way, addressing the reason why do global corporations have so much power? Why did these men during COVID earn X billions of dollars? How is this happening? This is really what this um, global treaty arrangement is about. It's the structural path whereby very few people are getting richer and richer and it's through the vehicle of the global corporations. So I think we, we do need to address that. I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, um, but um, I hope that at least you'll help to get the word out about it. There are very definite <laughs> blocks in media and so on once you do start talking about it, but I think we really have to. But we really must end now. We've already gone beyond our time. And I just want to thank everybody so much. Anya, did you want to say something first? No, I just wanted to see if Salim or Nelson wanted to say something because they've been very quiet. So maybe before we finish. Yes. Yeah. Just to come in in a very short um, is that the world discussion is all about food politics and who is controlling what we are eating and how do we change that mindset you know it's all about these food uh free trade agreements they are meant to actually try to bring whatever we are trying to set up at local level become part of the so-called global market but that market we that we will not even uh, qualify because it has lots of stringent measures so the whole idea here, when we want to bring in the local politicians on board, when we want to bring in the local policymakers on board is to try to influence their mindset to really understand what is local and why we want to emphasize what is local, because it has a lot of connections from inherited information or inherited actions and uh, behaviors that people have had for many years and that's what many local people many farmers are connected to and that's how they are surviving and how do we strengthen that it is just bringing those who could be in the uh, space of policy making to really understand and then they begin to, to 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 support and at the same time there is that misinformation within consumers consumers they believe whatever is being coming from the shop with very nice shapes and uh, information marketing speeches and ads and so on then also confuse confu confuse the consumers how do we bring the consumers on board to really understand to feel that whatever is being produced locally has got lots of value that they need to take on board so it's all about that connection and bringing those that matter and to bring a lot of evidence on board thank you so much nelson for us in local futures forever the focus on shifting the food system is the most important and for many people when you talk about the economy and when you talk about food they see them as separate uh, worlds and don't understand that we're talking about the production of the most important thing that we produce as human beings and this production is essentially being destroyed by economic policy and so Salim did you also want to say something as Anya was saying we haven't heard much from you uh, thank you I hear from everybody I think if we must uh, we want to move forward we have to take what Nelson has said and many of you. Uh, we have to reinforce our actions side by side locally. That is first. Secondly, we have to see new policies, new politics, as Charles Eisenstein, Eisenstein have written, and I learned it a little bit. And uh, third of all, we have to share know-how. I think it is important to have deals three ways. And I, I thank everybody to saying that local actions must give us the way to have new economy and shift from globalization to local economy that promotes our health and wellness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Those are beautiful closing words. 
You yes. said it for thank us. You. Yeah, and thank you so thank much you. for all of you and the point of being in touch soon again and moving this collaboration forward. And Anya, thank you so much for having done an excellent job in helping to pull together the whole program, working night and day for weeks and loving it. It's lovely work, isn't it? Being in touch with so many lovely people. Yeah. Thank it's you. It's been a so privilege. Much. Privilege. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. And there's thank one you. more you very much. later today. Or goodbye. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.